everyone. Good evening. Welcome. Thank you. All of that. I am so excited and a little nervous. <laughs> I'm Joan Lennis, current chair of the Emerge Vermont Board. I'd like to welcome you this evening to our virtual annual celebration of women in politics. I know that we um, would love to be in person, but this is, is a wonderful way to be together as well. And we're glad you're here with us tonight as we celebrate our accomplished alum and as we hear from two inspiring women leaders who are making a difference throughout New England. And I hope you're as excited as I am to honor Madeline Cunin Achievement Award recipient, former speaker Gay Symington. It's going to be a great show. Tonight's event would not be possible without the generous support of each and every one of you. We'd like to thank Congressman Peter, Peter Welch, Lisa Steele, the Vermont Democratic Party, Representative Tiff Bloomley, Dottie Deans and Lydia Spitzer, Rebecca Holcomb, Dwayne Peterson, Mayor Marone Weinberger, and um, our own state treasurer, Beth Pierce, Cree and Phil Linelak, Joan Lennis, Liv Penna, and Susan Ritz. Um, without your support, our mission to elect Democratic women to office would not be possible. And now I'd like to introduce you to Elaine Haney, our executive director who joined us in May. Take it away, Elaine. Thank you, Joan. I am so honored to be the new executive director of Emerge Vermont and to come on board at such an exciting time. Emerge Vermont has been a force in our state's politics since its founding in 2013 by Governor Madeline Cunin. Under Jill Krawinski's leadership, our alumni grew to 148 and dozens won election. In fact, three of them went on to win the highest leadership positions in the legislature, Lieutenant Governor Molly Gray, Senate Pro Tem Becca Ballant, and Jill herself, Speaker of the House. While it's tough to lose a leader as strong and committed as Jill, we're okay with it under those circumstances. <laughs> Jill, thank you for your leadership of Emerge Vermont and for being such a dedicated mentor to the women you've trained. I'm honored to continue your work and we are so very proud of you, Madam Speaker. We now have 149 alumni after this summer's National Campaign Boot Camp, another of the many trainings we offer to Democratic women considering running for office or working campaigns. We're gearing up for 2022 with even more trainings for women to develop the skills, tools, and confidence to run and win. Our signature training is an in-depth 70-hour program for candidates and campaign staff. The application is now open for class of 2022, which starts in January. We're offering our first step forward training for women considering running for select board and school board on November 4th, just in time for pre-town meeting day campaigning. And we're partnering with Emerge Maine for our first legislator toolkit webinar series, just for our alumni legislators. It's the beginning of more professional development offerings to come for alumni. But we can't do our work without you. We need you to share these opportunities with women you know would be great candidates and campaign staff. Please help us build our sisterhood so we can train more Democratic women all over Vermont. And speaking of building our sisterhood, I'm excited to announce that we have expanded Emerge Vermont's leadership to a cabinet of 22 amazing committed women. Our cabinet includes women leaders from all over Vermont many who have served in local government and state government, and some are looking forward to seeing on the ballot in, for re-election in 2022, like State Treasurer Beth Pierce and Representatives Kathleen James and Catherine Sims. With our new cabinet, we are focused on training women in every corner of Vermont at every age and reaching more women than ever before, especially women of color, to improve the representation of women at all levels of Vermont government. 2020 was a big year for Emerge Vermont, with 38 alumni winning seats and some flipping their district from red to blue. 
Emerge Vermont alumni have made Vermont eighth in the country for the number of women legislators. In 2022, the stakes are even higher. We want to see more women on every select board and school board in Vermont, in our legislature, in our executive branch, and representing us in Congress. More women in office throughout Vermont means tangible progress on the things that matter most. We need more Democratic women serving on local boards, the front line of anti-racism in our communities. We need more women in the State House and the executive branch to ensure reproductive liberty for all Vermonters, strong and sustained response to the climate crisis, equitable funding of education, affordable health care, and so much more. We need more women in Congress to break the partisan deadlock and work collaboratively on solutions to our nation's challenges. Going forward, Emerge Vermont is committed to ensuring women are better represented at all levels of government. As demographics transform the country and our state over the next 15 years, with Black, Brown, and Indigenous, unmarried, under 40, and LGBTQ women making up the majority of the country, we're proud to be part of Emerge's plan to ensure that more Democratic women representing this new American majority hold elected and appointed office. Allow us to reintroduce ourselves. The committee will be in order. Women are transforming the way we do politics. For the last 15 years, Emerge has served as the premier candidate training program for Democratic women, empowering thousands of women to lead the causes and communities of the future. When you enshrine my constitutional rights as a human being, and we're just getting started. In our next 15 years, we will expand our reach, pack the political pipeline all the way up. But while I may be the first woman in this office, I will not be the last. And repower political structures. Black, brown, and indigenous women, LGBTQ plus women, unmarried women, and young women, emerge women are the future. The revolution is underway. Emerge. We have a lot to accomplish in order to change the face of government, and we need your help to make it happen. You can help by making a contribution to Emerge Vermont to support our efforts to recruit and train Democratic women and campaign staff throughout our state or become a member of our sustainers, leadership, or sponsors circles by contributing at emergevt.org. You can also follow the link just sent to your email. And now I'd like to introduce to you Emerge Vermont cabinet member and former state representative, Helen Head. Hello, I'm Helen Head, a member of the Emerge Vermont cabinet. Kathleen James, was first elected to the Vermont House from Manchester in 2018. She won and ran again two years later. In the House, she's made quite a mark in the education world, focusing on that in her committee and in some of her special interest projects related to funding and the future of higher education. She has other interests as well that are of particular concern to her constituents in Bennington County. What is amazing about Kathleen as an Emerge Signature uh, graduate in 2018 is that she was considered an underdog in her race. She ran hard and well, um, and she won defeating uh, the um, incumbent Republican in the two seat district. She faced a different kind of challenge in 2020 uh, recruited someone to work with her as a Democrat running in the two seat district and um, together they won the primary and also won the general election, defeating um, the person who had, had run, she had beat in the primary and um, then who ran as an independent. So um, she's done a marvelous job um, coming in as a newbie and really flipping the seats in her district. Please welcome one of the newest members of our cabinet, Kathleen James.
Greetings to the fabulous Emerge tribe and congratulations to Speaker Symington for tonight's well-deserved award, an award that honors another legendary trailblazer in Vermont politics, Governor Madeline Cunin. On her inauguration day in January, 2021, Vice President Kamala Harris paid tribute to all of the women who had paved the way for her historic election. She thanked the generations of women, black women, Asian women, white, Latina, Native American women, who throughout our nation's history have fought so hard to secure and protect our right to vote, fighting for the fundamental right to be heard. In January, 2017, I stood on the steps of the Rayburn House Office Building in Washington, DC, with more than 100 women from my community. We had traveled overnight on buses to lend our bodies and our voices to the Women's March. And as long as I live, and probably longer than that, I will never forget that moment when I looked down Independence Avenue, standing alongside my wife and my daughters and so many of my friends, and saw a colorful, powerful, passionate sea of women. From all across the country, we were all there for the same reason, to fight for our fundamental right to be heard and to create change. And that day, I felt personally called to take action, to do something more, something bigger, something better, something powerful, something that would make a meaningful difference. Fast forward a few months, a friend referred me to Emerge, and I applied in the summer of 2017. At that time, a number of people in my community had asked me to consider running for the state legislature, and I kept saying, no way. And the reasons I listed were uh, many, and they were complicated, <laughs> professional, personal, financial, logistical, so many reasons to say no. But the real reason lodged deep inside my heart was this, why me? Why me? The reason I'm so grateful to Emerge Vermont is because Emerge helped me turn that question around from why me to why not me. It was a spiritual shift something that happened in my heart, an important journey toward finding my voice and owning my power. And that journey was fueled by Emerge. Inspired by all of my classmates and powered by a three woman campaign team from my Emerge cohort, I not only ran, but won in 2018. I defeated an incumbent, I flipped my seat from male to female, and I flipped my seat from Republican to Democrat. And it was a woman powered campaign too. Women from all across my district showed up for meetings, stuffed envelopes, organized events, donated, and knocked on doors all that summer and fall. So I'm here to give gratitude to Emerge for providing the rocket fuel and for helping me at a really pivotal moment in my own life to say something that changed me forever. Why not me? And why not all of us? So thanks again, and let's get fired up for 2022. Hello, I'm Helen Head, a member of the Emerge Vermont Cabinet, and I'm very pleased to be here today to introduce Jill Krawinski. Jill became the 92nd person to serve as the um, Speaker of the House and the fourth woman to hold a position. This was beginning in January of this year. Not surprising that Jill took on this role, given her vast background and political experience. She's helped countless Vermonters to run and win elected office. She served as assistant to the speaker, Speaker Gay Symington, and executive director of the Vermont Democratic Party. She ran herself for the House for the first time in 2012 and then and won and then proceeded to serve and win four additional times so far, um, she, representing the Old North End in Burlington. And um, she became the majority leader in 2017. I wish we had time to talk about all of Jill's um, policy uh, implementations because she's done some great work, particularly in poverty alleviation, but um, I think we don't have that time here, but what we can do is we can talk about her traits that make it so important for her to be in this role. 
She's a clear thinker and has a drive to win. Jill keeps her eyes on democratic values. And most importantly, she is kind and respectful to everyone she works with, whether um, a colleague, uh, an adversary, a, a friend, um, she works well with all House members, all members of the legislature and the public. Tonight's bittersweet for us because when Jill won her term as speaker in January, um, she needed to leave as executive director of Emerge Vermont. Um, we miss her terribly, and we're, but we're very grateful and excited that she's back here with us tonight. Welcome, Jill. Thank you so much, Helen. It is so great to be here celebrating with you all tonight. When I left Emerge to serve as the Speaker of the House, I knew the board would do a great job hiring a new executive director that would build on our work of recruiting and training women to run for office. Thank you and congratulations to the Emerge board who hired a fabulous, fabulous new executive director with Elaine Haney and tra transitioned to a new board structure to bring more women into our movement. I just want to thank that board for all their hard work. They are Joan Lennis, State Treasurer Beth Pierce, Brenda Churchill, Dottie Deans, Helen Head, Shana Casper, Alex McLean, and Sue Minter. Please join me in giving them a big round of applause. So I was so honored to help and recruit and train our 2020 and 2021 Emerge Signature training program classes. Because of the pandemic, they were not able to have a proper in-person celebration, but that moment will come in the future. Despite the pandemic, these 31 women graduated and they did it building new friendships, feeling empowered and ready to plot their political futures. I can't say enough about the power in this class and what they will achieve. And I just wanna say their names so we can celebrate them. I know we're not in a big room together, but we're all in our living rooms, in our offices, and let's give them a big round of applause. Asha Carroll, Kaylee calloway Kane, Elaine Ball, Elaine Haney, Emily Listowich, Emily Rosenbaum, Hannah King, Kara Transgard scott Catherine Becker Van Hayes, Kate Nugent, Kaylee Ann Flanagan, Karen Durfee, Seton McElroy, Adriana Eldridge, Alyssa Black, Christina Dealey, Denise McMartin, Gabrielle Stebbins, Gina McAllister, Kanika Gandhi, Karen Dolan, Carrie Dolan, Lizzie Haskell, Lizzie Shackelford, Martha Allen, Melissa Bata, Molly Gray, Olivia Pena, Samantha Sheehan, Sarah Swank, and Stephanie Wilby. You know these women and women have to be asked six or seven times before they decide to run for office, but these classes are changing that. I'm so proud of their tenacity, support for one another and their communities. So congratulations. And to the whole Emerge Sisterhood, we need you now more than ever. This upcoming election is gonna be hard for so many reasons, including redistricting. Together, we can recruit women to run for office, we can run for office, we can support women running for office and have each other's backs. And that's what's so incredibly special about the Emerge Sisterhood. We have each other's backs. And one of the hardest working women that I have ever seen working on the campaign trail in supporting women running for office is Speaker Gay Symington. I had the honor of working with her to win back the Democratic majority uh, in the House in 2004 and to serve as her assistant in the Speaker's office. I am so proud to be honoring her work and her legacy here tonight. We have a tremendous program ahead and I'm so excited to see all these amazing women, including Speaker Sarah Gideon here with us tonight. I know it's gonna be fantastic. Thank you so much for all of your support with Emerge and let's do this, thank you. Hi, I'm Dottie Deans. I'm a member of the Emerge Vermont cabinet and co-chair of the development committee. I'm delighted to introduce our next speaker, a woman who was a graduate of the inaugural Emerge Vermont class of 2014. Since then, Senator Becca Ballant has charted a leadership path that has brought her to her esteemed 
position today, where she serves as Vermont's first woman and first LGBT person to serve as president pro tem of the Vermont Senate. Senator Ballant has spent her legislative career championing the needs of women, children, families, and the most vulnerable. And she is at the forefront of the effort to amend the Vermont Constitution to preserve personal reproductive liberty. I'm proud to call Senator Ballin an Emerge sister and I always walk away with a meaningful tidbit from listening to Becca. Welcome, Senator Ballin. Thank you, Dottie. Thank you so much. I'm really delighted to be here with all of you this, on this big night. Emerge graduates, we are here to honor you and to launch you into the next phase of your leadership. I say the next phase because I know many of you and you're already leaders. You felt something inside of you that called you to the work of public office. You could either see yourself running for office or helping to run a campaign. And tonight, I want to give you permission to step fully into that part of yourself that believes that you are called to this work. This is just the next step in your leadership journey, and it's not the beginning. You know so much already. Emerge grads, I want you to do you, to be genuine, to be rooted in your values, to be willing to crack your hearts wide open and love the people that you serve, and to understand, really, really understand what they need. It is my pleasure tonight to be thinking about a keynote that I gave some years ago at a conference in Burlington. It was a networking event for women who work in the renewable energy industry. It's a field that is um, in which women are greatly outnumbered by men. And the organizer asked me to give an overview of the bills being introduced in the Senate that related to renewable energy. And she said that's what she wanted, but I didn't quite believe her because I sensed that the audience actually needed to hear something really different from me. They'd already spent two days listening to folks talk nonstop about policy. They didn't need me to blather on at them for another you know, 10 or 15 minutes. And so I stepped back for a minute and I thought about the political situation that we are in, in this nation. And I thought about how after so many years of making strides, we seem to be stalled. And I thought about how lonely, really lonely it can be when you are the only woman at a firm or the only person of color or the only gay person or the only immigrant. And that's a heavy weight that comes with being in that position of being the only one. And once when I, I lived in Wyoming, which is where my wife is from, um, I taught at a school in the desert city of Casper. And the other teachers knew me as that gal from back east. That's what they used to call me. And one day another teacher came into my classroom in the morning as I was sitting in my classroom. And she said, are you really from Vermont? And I said, yes. And, and she paused and then she whispered, are you a Democrat? And when I said, <laughs> I am a Democrat. She <laughs> exhaled and she said, oh, thank goodness. I've been the only one in this building for 20 years. <laughs> and so we know, we know, we know that it's tough when you're the only one. So I've thought about this experience and others that, that I've had that are similar over the years. And it helps to ground me in a better understanding of my constituents and how they might be feeling. I thought about the women who were in that room. And as I thought carefully about their work situations and their feelings, I really wanted to acknowledge the importance of their work and help guide them in connecting with each other. So I delivered the speech that I thought they needed and not necessarily the one that the organizer asked for. And it was a risk. And I made myself vulnerable and I swung out a little bit. And I'm happy to say that it paid off because afterwards, a woman approached me and she said, somehow you knew, you said 
what we were all thinking. It was like you could see our thoughts swirling above our heads. And that was a beautiful moment. It's an amazing gift that we can give to each other to really see each other and to sit with each other in our experiences. So I want you, as you think about your leadership journey, I want you to think about how you can always honor the audience before you. We have to serve our constituents with compassion. We have to be willing to be vulnerable with them. And I also want you to think about what kind of impact you want to have on the people you serve. Because we all have impact every day, each day, in hundreds of interactions. We smile, we nod, uh, sometimes we show a scowl of impatience or a spontaneous laugh. We choose to either lean in or opt out. We can speak our minds or we can choose to remain silent. And it doesn't matter if you acknowledge it or not, you've still impacted the people around you today in the way that you carried yourself, in how you talk to acquaintances and strangers or how you chose to ignore them. When you are asked to speak to your constituents, of course you have to think about the content of the talk, but just as importantly, you have to consider the impact that you wanna have on your audience. Start from what you want to stir in them and let that guide your words. And I know that it can be difficult to trust that you have what it takes to serve in public office. But the secret is that if you're rooted in your values and you know who you are at your core, this is gonna guide you through all the many rough patches. So get right with yourself first. Think about the values you wanna lead from. Integrity, kindness, empathy, candor, fairness, Will your leadership be about lifting up other voices? Will it be about connecting and understanding? Get clear and solid on where you're going to lead from, because if you don't, you're going to be like a branch in the wind, and that will not honor the people that you serve. So tonight, Asha, Seton, Kaylee, Hannah, Karen, Elaine Bell, Catherine, Emily Listowich, Kate, Elaine Haney, Karen, Emily Rosenbaum, and Kaylee Ann, I am so excited for you and I'm excited for Vermont that you're stepping up. I want you to be women of substance. I want you to be women of compassion and courage. We need you. We need you. Thank you. Well, I'm delighted to be part of this evening celebration. It's such a good feeling uh, to know that success has been after success after success has been there for Emerge. And when it was founded, I believe it was eight years ago, uh, we had no idea that we would have this kind of outreach. And the fact that I believe in the last election, 79% of the women who went through Emerge actually made it, they got elected. So Emerge, is not only great for the individual woman who is running, who learns new skills and new confidence. Emerge forms a, a group, you might call it a support group, where women, once a woman throws her hat in the ring, uh, other women help her keep that hat there and help her in moments of crisis and moments of doubt. and. I'm just very happy that Emerge has had such great leadership and great graduates. And it's my pleasure to, to introduce one of the sterling graduates of Emerge, Molly Gray, Lieutenant Governor Molly Gray. Uh, I first knew Molly many years ago when she was my, in my class at the University of Vermont on women in politics. And she was, as you might imagine, a very good student. And we've kept in touch ever since. And she has plunged right in. She is aware of the issues. She's proud to be a native Vermonter. 
from an agricultural part of the state. She's talented, she's, she's skilled, she takes everything she learned from Emerge and takes it further to make it her very own. So it's my great pleasure and gives me special satisfaction to introduce to you Lieutenant Governor Molly Gray. Thank you, Governor. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you this evening. And from my living room to your kitchen, to your dining room, wherever you're Zooming in tonight or following along via YouTube, um, it's wonderful to be together with so many sisters and supporters of Emerge Vermont. I want to thank Governor Kunin. I want to thank you for your mentorship, for your leadership, for your friendship, but also for the strength you gave me every day over my during my first session in the state house i remember walking out of the lieutenant governor's office walking down the hall and just before walking up the steps to the vermont senate looking to my right and there is a portrait of you and as many of the women here know uh, who worked in the state house there are not a lot of portraits of women so that courage that strength um, that little bit of connection every day making sure that I know and that so many Vermont women know that if you can see it, you can be it. And we can st still see your presence in the State House every day. So thank you. Um, as I said, it's wonderful to be here tonight. I wish we were together in person. I look forward to that moment. Uh, I want to give a special um, congratulatory and heartfelt um, shout out to Gay Symington, who you'll hear from later, who's tonight's uh, Governor or CUNIN Achievement Award recipient, and I can't think of a more deserving person um, for this award this year. It's also an honor to be amongst so many incredible women, and I want to talk just briefly about uh, what it was like as a first time moment. Uh, I want to give a special... Oops, I wanna... We've got some technical difficulties, but I wanted to talk just for a brief moment about what it was like to run as a first time candidate and why Emerge Vermont was so important. Um, as a young woman, as a candidate from a perhaps non-traditional path to office and as someone coming to a race with not a lot of um, uh, resources and means, Emerge Vermont and the training program was so critical from that very first practice fundraising call that was so deeply uncomfortable to standing up in front of so many women and saying, actually saying why I wanted to run and putting myself out there and being vulnerable. And so not only was the support of Emerge critical to a sex, successful um, campaign last year, but, I, but the friendships, the connections, the support um, through thick and thin and all of the women who were there when I decided to jump, um, said, we're gonna jump with you and we'll be there for you. So my most heartfelt thanks, I'm so, honored to be where I am and I look forward to reciprocating in 2022, which we will talk about. But there's one thing Emerge did not prepare me for, and that is the moment, the very first moment as Lieutenant Governor. I had just taken my oath and I was wearing a white suit and I was prepared and my heart was racing and I stepped forward onto that dais and looked down getting ready to speak and found my itty bitty kitten heel falling through the floor of the Vermont Senate. And lo and behold, below the dais is a heating grate. And I had this moment as a former cross country ski racer where I put my little heels right on the strongest part of that grate and got through my speech and promptly um, after the speech and as the weekend approached, went to Lowe's with my now husband, purchased a piece of plywood, brought it to the Senate, put a mat over it where it now stands. But I tell you the story because there are still so many places where we have to find our footing, where there are systems, physical systems or systems that are not set up for women um, who are ready to lead. And in fact, we haven't had a woman in the Lieutenant Governor's office since 1997. So, we still need to see women in leadership positions and we still need good footing, which brings me to 2022. And while there's so much that we don't know about the next year, there's a lot that we do know. And I wanna share with you what I know. I know that we're going to see women running for office up and down the ticket 
in an exciting way. We're going to see women blazing new trail. We're going to see bold and deeply inclusive, transformative campaigns run by women. We're going to see a focus on uh, deeply progressive and democratic issues. And I think in particular, the economic well-being of families and the economic well-being of women, because women have been more deeply impacted by this pandemic than a lot of other groups. We're going to focus on paid family and medically. We're going to focus on childcare. We're going to focus on caregiving and so much more. But more than anything, I hope and I believe we're going to see more women from all sorts of backgrounds and experiences, women who have never run for office before stepping up. And that's what I'm excited about in 2022. So I'll close by saying this. I wanna thank everyone here tonight who has been supportive of Emerge Vermont, who has stepped up, who has provided um, encouragement, um, advice, um, and so much more. And to all of you thinking about running, be it a re-election or a first-time race, my office is your office. You have my support. I will bring a piece of plywood for you if you need it. And I look forward to making history in 2022 with so many women here and making 2022 a historic and exciting year for our state. So thank you again to everyone here tonight. And I look forward to working with you um, in the days, weeks, years ahead. everyone. I wanted to thank Elaine and Emerge Vermont for the opportunity to introduce our next speaker. I've known Bo Yang since we met in a bar in Montpelier. No, really. In truth, I was invited to a small gathering to celebrate Karen Richards' retirement, but mostly to meet her successor. The moment is etched in my memory. I imagine there could be there could not be two people who were more different at that gathering, yet we bonded quickly and have been collaborators ever since. After she got her Doctor of Law degree at the University of Minnesota Law School in 2003, Bohr practiced in the areas of family law, government benefits, and social security law, representing indigent clients and victims of domestic violence in a nonprofit organization. Working for the Vermont HRC since 2015 and becoming the executive director in November of 2018, the ethnic Hmong woman became the first person of color to head the Vermont Human Rights Campaign, excuse me, commission until uh, since the state agency was formed in 20, in uh, 1988. Boy, I'll tell you these dates. It, it is with great pleasure that I introduce my friend, 
Vermont Human Rights Commission Executive Director Bor Yang. Thank you. Hello, thank you for having me here today. My name is Bor Yang and I'm the Executive Director of the Vermont Human Rights Commission. I wanna start off today with just a quick story. A couple of years ago, I took my mother-in-law to the doctors. She was using a cane at the time. I have a physical disability, so I use a crutch all of the time. We walked in together. The doctor came out of his office, took a look at us, and then chuckled and laughed. Then he said, whoa, whoa, whoa. What happened here? Oh my gosh, who's helping who? Who drove who? How did you get here? And I let him go on like this for a couple of minutes. And finally, I just said, I have a disability and I drove her here. She has an appointment with you. I thought, has he never seen two people with disabilities occupy the same space before? Does he not know that someone could have a temporary or permanent disability and care for themselves or others? The answer was of course, no. He had no frame of reference, no experience, no relationship to draw from to interpret the situation. It was entirely novel to him. He's not a bad person, not immoral or incapable of change, but he lacked understanding and in the moment, a willingness to acknowledge his ignorance. There are a lot of good people smart and capable people in the world with limited experiences. While this man can certainly continue to be my mother-in-law's doctor, I don't think I would choose him to represent me in decisions concerning accessibility and economic opportunities for people with disabilities, especially when there are always other competing interests. Studies have shown us that white legislators respond more to their white constituents. Mock jurors find evidence more or less credible based on skin color. And that people will favor those in their in-groups when there is a close call. And how often are our leaders making those close calls? As someone who testifies before the legislature regularly, I can tell you that decisions often come down to personal beliefs, which then drive priorities, a credibility determination of witnesses, and then ultimately votes. When a bill to ensure paid family leave does not pass, children go without childcare or parents quit their jobs. When a bill to raise the minimum wage does not pass, a family goes without a car or without food. When the standard for harassment is so high, women are forced to choose between their housing and their safety, their jobs and autonomy over their bodies. You deny their children the best schools or school choice. You deny them promotions and leverage to change their lives and the lives of others. In Vermont, Asian American women make 64 cents on the dollar as compared to their white male counterparts. Ask anyone to think about this disparity in the context of the larger scheme of discrimination. And they might tell you that that 36 cents difference is really not that significant. But 36 cents amounts to a lifetime loss of over $700,000. What is the value of that? That is a very healthy and generous investment portfolio. It is a gorgeous house, two beautiful homes, or three very nice houses. It's an inheritance that you can leave your kids. It is the difference between having money and making money. It is a ticket out of generational poverty. But to all women, BIPOC women, transgender women, women who are mothers and women who are mothers to all children in Vermont, the meaning of that 36 cents is not lost upon us. The global pandemic and social unrest of this past year 
has shined a light on this country and the institutions that hold up privilege, wealth, and men. Institutions that leave so many of us behind. But the times are upon us to change. In fact, we can no longer afford not to. When all different types of women show up in government and positions of power, the tides turn. We draw from our experiences to find compassion, empathy, will, but most importantly, fortitude to change that which many in our community have found impossible to change. This is the power of representation. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm State Treasurer Beth Pierce, and I'm also a proud member of the Emerge Vermont Cabinet. As one of the few women in Vermont history elected to statewide office, I can attest to the necessity of an organization like Emerge, whose mission is to recruit and train more Democratic women to run for office. It is my pleasure and honor to introduce Congressman Peter Welch. I have known Congressman Welch for many years and know that he has always advocated for issues that affect women. Peter has been a proud Emerge Vermont sponsor for many years and is also part of the Men for Emerge Vermont. He strongly supports our mission of electing more Democratic women to office. Peter is a champion of reproductive rights. He re recently hosted a roundtable with key advocates to highlight the importance of the Rep Reproductive Liberty Amendment, which would enshrine reproductive rights in the Vermont Constitution. He also co-sponsored and voted in favor of the Women's Health Protection Act which would protect abortion rights for women across the United States. Peter is also a strong advocate for other issues critical to women, including paid family leave, childcare support, and comprehensive and affordable health care. In an era of partisanship, Peter works hard to bring people together to find common ground and common sense solutions. As a Vermonter, I am proud that he represents our state in Congress. I am honored to introduce him to you. Welcome. Congressman Welch. Uh, good evening. I am so delighted uh, to be here uh, with, uh, first of all, Madeline Kuhn and Governor Kuhn. Uh, thank you for all you did uh, in your public service here. Uh, I first began my service in the State House uh, when you were Lieutenant Governor. And uh, it was really an incredible thing to see you work as well and as hard as you did. And I also want to salute Gay Symington, uh, who's the award winner tonight. Gay, I don't remember any more intense experience in the State House uh, in those years you and I worked together, you as Speaker and when I was Senate President. And I so admired uh, your skill, your energy, your intellect, uh, and your commitment and the extraordinary work uh, that you did to make education funding. Uh, much more fair to our kids around the entire state. It was truly remarkable. And the respect you commanded uh, as Speaker of the House was, was really extraordinary. Uh, also, it's amazing. You know, we have so many magnificent leaders. And when I was listening uh, to our Lieutenant Governor, Molly Gray, uh, to our Senate President, Becca Ballant, uh, and of course, to our Speaker, Jill Krawinski, uh, I was thinking about uh, the comments you made about what drew you to public service and what the opportunities are. And there's a couple of things that are, I think, so uh, important about the contributions that women in particular do make. And it goes back uh, to reminding me of how Madeline Kuhn herself got involved in politics. It was embedded in the community, an orientation towards the community and seeing and observing what needed to be done in figuring out a way to do it. And as I recall, Madeline, uh, before you were in the State House, before you would run for, uh, uh, for state representative uh, from Burlington, uh, there was a traffic issue. And it was an issue about whether there'd be a stop sign, as I recall, and no one would listen, uh, but it was a, a major situation for kids. You saw something that needed to be done and you decided the way to do it was to run for office. And lo and behold, you were right, you succeeded, you did it uh, pre-emerge. You had to bear this uh, whole responsibility on your own. But that sensibility that you had, uh, that Gay had, uh, that Molly and Becca um, 
and Jill have about public service being rooted in observing what is happening in your community and how can you help. Uh, and the second thing that I've been so impressed by and learned uh, from the example of so many uh, women I've served with is that politics it has to be a collaborative effort. You know, it may be that you have a strong vision of what you want to do, but if any of us are going to be successful, it requires there to be collaboration. And of course, women are so, so much better at that uh, <laughs> than, than men are. And the only way you ultimately can, can be successful is to be able to work with people and get people to see that there's a common outcome, a common goal, and there can be a common shared success. So the, the work that Emerge has done uh, by essentially empowering people who are starting out wondering, can I do this or not? Will I be supported? How do I give a speech? How do I make a fundraising phone call? Uh, as Molly was describing and getting that practice, but having that sense of solidarity that you're not alone and that when you get into office, you take that spirit with you to create that collaborative effort that is so essential if we're gonna get things done in this extraordinarily divided world. Uh, you know, all the things that we're talking about are so much part of the Build Back Better uh, program uh, that, of course, President Biden is his signature approach. And I'm delighted to be working with Nancy Pelosi, who's, as we all know, just a ferocious advocate and the most extraordinary legislat legislator uh, in my lifetime. So uh, I'm a proud supporter of Emerge. Uh, uh, I've been uh, a strong supporter and a financial contributor, and I intend to continue doing that. And I'm honored to work uh, with each and every one of you uh, to achieve the goals of more women in high public office. Now we're going to have uh, we're going to hear from two extraordinary women who have been extremely successful. Uh, following a lot of the principles of Emerge, both of them are Emerge graduates. Uh, governor Janet Mills uh, will be on shortly. And as you know, she's governor of Maine. Uh, she got more votes uh, than any other person running for governor ever in the history of Maine. Uh, Maine's a contentious place. They've got rough and tumble politics, but she's the first governor since 1996 who got a majority of votes uh, to win the governorship in her first effort. and. Uh, of course, the next uh, pardon me, speaker that we're going to hear is a former Senate president herself. And, uh, and that, of course, is Sarah Gideon. And Sarah Gideon served two terms as speaker. Uh, she ran also as the Democratic nominee uh, for the United States Senate in May in 2020 and came close. And it's much to my sadness, and I, I know Senator Leahy's sadness and Bernie's sadness as well. Uh, that she didn't quite win, but she's now at the Harvard Institute of Politics. She's a strong, uh, lifelong, uh, co committed person to public service, and we all look forward to hearing uh, from both Governor Mills and former Speaker Gideon. Thank you uh, very much for letting me be part of this very special evening. Hello, this is Maine Governor Janet Mills. I'm honored to join you and join Emerge Vermont in this virtual celebration of women in politics particularly honoring the legacy of Madeleine Kunin. In two, 2021, the state of Vermont was in the top 10 states nationwide for the percentage of women in your legislature at 42.2%. That's amazing. Women don't just serve in your state government, they're leading it with Lieutenant Governor Molly Gray and President Pro Tem of the Vermont Senate, Becca Balint, Senate Majority Leader Allison Clarkson, Speaker of the House Jill Krowinski, House Majority Leader Emily Long, House Minority Leader Patricia McCoy, House Progressive Leader Celine Colburn in the General Assembly, as well as Treasurer Beth Pierce. Amazing. In the General Assembly, I understand the chairs of the House and Senate Appropriations Committees are both women, as are the chairs of the House Ways and Means Committee and Senate Finance Committee. In addition, three agency secretaries, two Supreme Court justices, six of 14 states attorneys, county attorneys, one of 14 sheriffs, and the chancellor of your state colleges are all women. That's an important and impressive milestone. 
Now, Maine is a little bit ahead of you at 43.5% of our state legislature being women. Nine out of 15 of my cabinet members are women, the most in our state's history. We have our first woman secretary of state, Shanna Bellows. Four out of the six legislative leaders are women. Of course, half of our congressional delegation are women. There's only four of them, but we include Congresswoman Shelley Pingree, first woman ever to represent the first district, first congressional district of Maine. Our state also boasts its second female chief justice, who was recently unanimously confirmed by the state Senate, Valerie Stanfill. Now, nationally, we bask in the uh, fact of having the first woman vice president of the United States, woohoo, and the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, in Washington. Still, we have much more to do, and we know it. Women need to run for office because, as we know, women can win. So what are the barriers to women running for office? What are the barriers to progress? I think too often we're told women are afraid. Women are afraid of not winning. There's risk-taking here. Well, there's risk-taking in everything we do. The risk of not winning, the risk of a misstatement, the risk of a misstep. But hey, what things in life are worth doing that don't involve risk? As the great congresswoman from Texas, Barbara Jordan, once said, not making a difference is a thing we cannot afford. That's why we take risks. Making a difference in lives of the lives of others and the lives of our states, making a difference involves jumping hurdles, climbing walls, juggling tasks, and sometimes mending fences. All of us has, have faced walls and barriers of various sorts. And what you've been doing during, during the Emerge classes is tearing down walls within and without and building friendships, building networks. I've been thinking a lot lately about walls, fences, and barriers. I was thinking back to when I was living in Europe some decades ago, when during the summer I hitchhiked to the city of Berlin, and I visited the infamous wall, the Berlin Wall, separating East Berlin from West Berlin. It was an unforgettable sight, a solid wall that separated people, East Berlin people from their from their cousins, their neighbors and countrymen in West Berlin and the rest of the world. It was a symbol of intolerance that physically imprisoned an entire society against their will. I contemplated the Berlin Wall for a long time in silence. I thought of the poem by Robert Frost, Mending Wall, you know, something there is that doesn't love a wall that sends the frozen groundswell under it and spills the upper boulders in the sun. Something, that, something there is that doesn't love a wall that wants it down. Nearly 20 years later, the Berlin Wall did come down and people were freed. Many years later in the Maine legislature and today as governor, I think very consciously about the walls that words build. When looking at bills and legislation, each time I think about what those words are walling in, what they might be walling out, whether there are other words that might do the, do the task and not create uh, unintended barriers and restrictions. I think in Emerge, in Emerge trainings, uh, we teach and we learn to use words wisely. Words that make a difference. Words that will build bridges, not walls. Bridges to the common good that we intend to make, make positive in our public lives. Finding common ground. Years ago, I also found myself at a different kind of wall. On a trip to Jerusalem, I visited the so-called Western Wall, or sometimes called the Wailing Wall. That wall is a holy place, a place where the ancient remains of a, of a much larger structure exist that was once the foundation for an enormous holy temple, standing at the intersection of history, the meeting place of three major world religions, a wall that was tragically insufficient some 2,000 years ago to withstand the Roman warriors and the fires that destroyed that temple and drove an entire civilization away from their homeland. People have died for that wall. It is so sacred and so controversial. People gather there and they, gather there and they hold hands and they pray and they place paper prayers 
in the cracks of the wall, expecting that those prayers will go directly to God. I realized, looking at that wall, that the same structures that were built to keep people out and keep people in can evolve into things that are building blocks, things that bring people together and draw them like a magnet. What are the walls in your life? Are there barriers that are self-imposed or barriers that you grew up with? Are there walls of words that prevent people in your life from understanding you or prevent you from understanding others? Are there, are there walls of insecurity that prevent us from rising in life? Are there walls of bias or ignorance, barriers of complacency, of self-confidence or lack thereof? Can you turn these barriers into fences to support friendships, trellises that will support trailing flowers, temples of a different kind? In campaigning for office, you will discover, as I did, that you can confront and overcome many barriers, and you will appreciate the good differences and good fences that do make good neighbors. When you hit a wall, don't stop there. Reach out and shake a hand. Use the best words you can find to remove those barriers. Find common ground. Make the most of the differences that you discover. Turn your walls into foundations for lasting relationships so that the false wall of the glass ceiling will come down for all of us once and for all. May your walls all be good fences not barbed wire barriers, but durable frames for friendship and success. May the women in politics today welcome the women in politics of tomorrow. Thank you, and good luck to the Emerge Women of Vermont. Greetings from Maine. Hello. Thank you so much for that warm welcome, Congressman Welch. And thank you so much to Emerge Vermont for inviting me to be a part of this special evening. Tonight, we celebrate you and the mission you are fulfilling every day, because that mission of training Democratic women to run for office is more important than ever before. But let's be clear, what you do here at Emerge Vermont isn't just about training. What you do starts with the conversations that tell women their voice must be heard and their seat at the table must be taken. It spreads far and wide into the future with the network and sisterhood that has emerged. And I'm here to tell you today that without Emerge, I might not have ever run. I might not have won that first state house race. I might have never seen myself as the leader I was able to become. So good evening, Emerge Vermont. Let's celebrate. My name is Sarah Gideon. I live in Freeport, Maine with my husband, Ben, and our three kids, Julian, Alec, and Josie. Today, I'm a resident fellow at the Institute for Politics at the Harvard Kennedy School. But I began my public service on Freeport, Maine's town council. I served four terms after that in the Maine House of Representatives, becoming assistant leader in my second term and presiding over the house as speaker for my final two terms. And I was proud to run a race as the Democratic candidate for US Senate for Maine in 2020. I've run for office where less than 50 votes made the difference on a shoestring budget and have run others where we broke fundraising records and made national headlines on a daily basis. I'm also a proud Emerge Maine alumni. And what I will share with you is that in every single race I have run, that training and that network has been my foundation, my inspiration and my source of strength not just the literal tools in my tool belt, but the sisterhood that propelled me forward in the most challenging of times and inspired me in the best of times. In 2017, in my first term as speaker, I presided over a Democratic caucus that had 36 women, 12 of whom were Emerge graduates. My partner in leadership was Erin Herbig, one of the 12 Emerge alumni also. Together, we made the kind of changes we knew state government needed, creating a nursing mother's room in the state house, supporting our staff and members by demonstrating and modeling that you can work hard governing and still take care of your family too, setting legislative hours that didn't require people to work into the wee hours of the night. 
we served and divided government with a very, very challenging governor. We weathered tough negotiations, razor thin margins, and even a state shutdown. And we listened to our governor refer to our male colleagues in leadership as our bosses. So when it came time to fulfill one of my greatest responsibilities as speaker, candidate recruitment, we put our mission into place. Recruit more women to run. Find the best candidate for every district. Convince those women to run. Fundraise to support them. Partner with Emerge to train them and put the campaign plans in place. It meant lots and lots of coffee meetings, explaining to women who maybe hadn't yet experienced Emerge that yes, you are qualified to run. And yes, we will make it work. And that meant that as I was sworn in for speaker a second time, for the first time in Maine history, in our House Democratic Caucus, the women outnumbered the men. We were 49 women, making up 55% of our caucus. Now, that made all the difference in what we could achieve under Maine's first woman governor, Janet Mills. A prolific campaigner herself, Janet Mills has long been a teacher of one of the most popular Emerge Main trainings when she was serving as attorney general. I won't even try to emulate it for you, but let me just say there was a very dramatic reenactment of her experiences knocking doors, her suggestions to wear blaze orange, and the different types of dogs she encountered. And with our new Emerge founding female governor, with our Democratic majorities and majority women House Caucus, we got to work. Enacting paid time off, pursuing paid family and medical leave, expanding access to birth control, strengthening access to safe abortions, and ensuring that a woman's income level would not prevent her from the reproductive care she was seeking. And we increased reimbursements for childcare for working parents living in poverty. All that was possible because of the power of this organization and the reality of what happens when we elect democratic women. We lift each other up, we do the hard work, and we get things done. Emerge was an important part of my US Senate race as well. From the very beginning, women across the country were there to lend their support, their email lists, their phones, their businesses, their expertise, and their arms for a hug. You see, Emerge graduates and elected officials provided good counsel, strategic advice, and feet on the ground, as well as fundraising help. And we don't always talk about this part, but when the outcomes of our races don't finish in a win, that training and that sisterhood is there too. Because when we put ourselves in an arena, we don't always win. Having each other to remind ourselves that it is always worth doing, that there is always another day, another way to take part, to make change or another race to run, that is so vitally important too. The work that happens in an eMERGE class is just so remarkable. It can really change the course of someone's life and it can really change the world around us. I know it did for me and so many others. And I'm so very grateful for that experience and for all of you here in Vermont and the Emerge affiliates across the country. Thank you so very much for this opportunity. And I hope that we get to really see each other in the very near future.
Good evening. I'm Sue Minter, and it is such an honor for me tonight to be able to introduce to you this year's recipient of our CUNIN Achievement Award, which is given annually to a Democratic woman who has served as an important role model and mentor for other women in their political, professional, and educational pursuits. Gay Symington has had a profound impact on the political landscape of Vermont. She was first elected to the Vermont House in 1996 and became the House Minority Leader in 2003, because back in those days, Democrats were in the minority. But Gay decided to change the story. She worked incredibly hard recruiting candidates from all over Vermont to set the stage for enough elected Democrats to retake the House majority in 2004. And that January, 2005, she was unanimously elected to be Speaker of the Vermont House, becoming only the second woman in our history to hold that position, something that has changed. I will never forget the palpable excitement, the profound sense of pride that filled the well of the house that day when Gay took her place at the podium to present her maiden speech. And I remember so well what a difference it made to me as a first term legislator to see a woman in charge and to know in a very deep way that I belonged in this chamber. You know, the State House truly changed under Gay's speakership. The Democratic majority in the House continued to expand, as did the number of elected women. And significantly, Gay elevated the leadership role of women, particularly as the chairs of the money committees, something that is still in place today. Now, Gay is and was a policy wonk. And her leadership was about sowing many seeds of change during her tenure from Vermont's clean energy transformation to our embrace of healthcare reform to enhancing farm viability and village vitality. But in addition to policy, Gay sought to foster a healthy and respectful work environment at the State House. For one thing, she required all legislators to take sexual harassment trainings something new and, shall I say, needed. But she also added a new dimension to our daily devotionals by including poets, high school jazz bands, and by honoring through poignant moments of silence each one of our Vermont service members killed in war overseas. Gay left the House in 2008 to run a courageous gubernatorial campaign, and I can attest to the fortitude and endurance that running for governor requires. But through her humility, her intelligence, and deep love of our state, Gay Symington has exemplified that true leadership is about stepping out of your comfort zone, taking risks on behalf of your community to advance new ideas. I am so thrilled to introduce the winner of Emerge Vermont 2021 CUNIN Achievement Award, Gay Symington. Thank you so much, Sue. It's really such an honor to be introduced by you, someone who's accomplished so much for Vermont in elected office, in running an agency, um, and now working every day for low-income Vermonters through Capstone. Thank you. Thank you also to Emerge Cabinet members and tonight's other speakers. I'll call out in particular, um, Governor Kunin and Speaker Kowinski as having consistently nudged me out of my comfort zone and had my back through thick and thin. They continue to inspire me. When Joan Lennis first told me about Emerge's decision to honor me, I felt as if she had pulled a dress out of the back of my closet and one I hadn't worn recently and it didn't feel all that familiar. Like, does this still fit? Is it still me? In my reaction, I recognized the way it's too easy for many of us to envision political engagement as something that's a little weird or ill-fitting or out of date. It's the same reaction a friend gave recently when I suggested she should include 
running for office on her eventual to-do list. She shuddered. When I shrink from revisiting a political role or when my friend cringes at the thought of entering politics, what are we saying? By staying clear of politics, we step back from the responsibility to change how politics can be done. If we leave politics to those who are naturally inclined to it, we end up with exactly the kind of political system that is self-perpetuating and makes us shudder at the thought of running for office. Political service is not the only route to making change. I've been incredibly lucky to have worked for businesses, nonprofits, and now the Vermont Community Foundation where great people are working for more sustainable and just future. But without a framework of public policy, regulations, and budgets that work for every Vermonter, those sectors are severely compromised. Politics can make a huge difference when it's set up to listen to and respond to the needs of everyone. That's less likely if leaders are predominantly from a particular booming generation and one race and gender. Diversity of representation matters. On the floor of the Vermont House, I remember how the tenor of the debate would shift when a member spoke from personal experience rather than from statistics or generalities. Whether as a gay Vermonter during debates about marriage equity, as a person of color during discussions of racism at places of employment, as a single mom working for access to high quality childcare, or, or a millennial speaking to the burden of student debt. I remember a sunny late summer day when I was running for governor. Following Jill's orders, I was circulating among picnickers in Manchester. One family I reached out to was from Connecticut, where at the time Jody Rell was governor. When I introduced myself, their young son asked his parents, can boys run for governor too? His vision of what could be could have been constrained by what he saw. When women run for and serve in leadership roles, they change what people see and therefore what they can imagine. That's true when children of color see leaders who look like them. And when young Vermonters see leaders who graduated from high school in this century. It's not enough to ensure diverse candidates can aspire to run. We need to overcome barriers that stand between those aspirations and their success. Emerges coaching and peer networking benefit the women who participate, and it also allows them to support other women, as when Diane Kirsten Glitman, an Emerge graduate in Jericho, who serves on the Mount Mansfield Union School Board, extended support to the woman who now chairs that board. Other, uh, other barriers are more uncomfortable to call out, and I don't mean to convey disrespect for Congressman Peter Welsh, especially when he said such nice things about me, or his Senate colleagues in Vermont's tiny but mighty federal delegation. Vermont has been well served by their hard work and their values. The economic and social impact of their seniority cannot be lightly dismissed. But Vermont remains the only state in the union that has never elected a woman to serve in Washington. The only way that will change is for one or more of them to step down or for someone to challenge them. Now I can feel the collective shuddering in your Zoom boxes, just like me taking out that old dress and just like my friend who couldn't see herself in politics. Elections, including primary elections are an essential part of democracy. If someone decides to step into a primary I hope the wait your turn or can't be done pundits and skeptics and press will allow a full debate between the benefits of retaining a seasoned and powerful all male, all white and elderly like me delegation versus the opportunity to be served by someone who would bring different lived experience and different wisdom to Washington. I'm grateful for this honor and for the chance to speak with you tonight. In the coming election year, I hope you will rein in any shuddering first reaction to stepping into a leadership role yourself or hearing out and perhaps working hard for someone else who runs for elected office. Thank you. 
Gay, congratulations. Oh, my heart is beating with your words and your leadership. Thank you. Thanks from Emerge Vermont's cabinet, our alumna and supporters for your service in Vermont and to women. I also want to say thank you for being a mentor and friend to me, sitting at my dining room table talking about Democrats needing to be in the majority. You were the force behind having that happen, as Sue mentioned earlier. Such an inspiration. So congratulations again. Before we end our evening, I'd like to have all of us join together and honor our founder, Governor Madeline Kunin. At Emerge Vermont, we champion women, train them and support them as they forge on their own leadership paths. But there is no woman in Vermont who has had more excuse me, more impact on women in leadership than you, Madeline Kunin. You've been our, you've been our governor, our legislator, lieutenant governor, ambassador, stateswoman, organizer, and author. Madeline, you're our North Star for so many of us and for the world. And so we thank you, Madeline, and we are indebted to you for just being um, Emerge founder, but for your lifetime commitment to fostering the cause of women, for providing us all with your example of leadership, advocacy, and strength. You are an inspiration to all of us. And I mean that from me, from the bottom of my heart as well. And so, it is my pleasure, my honor, and my true delight to introduce you, Governor Madeline Kunin. Hello. Well, thank you so much, Joan. I've been inspired anew by all the speeches and, and all the um, wisdom that has been dispensed here over Zoom and over YouTube. And uh, I just want to second Gail Symington's brave but very appropriate necessary remark about how we may hopefully live to see a woman in Congress from Vermont. And I know the whole point of Emerge is to enable women to enter politics, to make them realize it's, it's good work, it's fun, it's important, it's life-changing. But I'm at the stage where I'm post-politics and I'm a uh, published poet at this point. And I guess I only mention that because there is life after politics. I mean, some people think, well, you have to commit your whole life and give up everything else you're interested in, but you don't. You can go on from there and continue to leave a, live a good life. So thank you very much for your very generous words. I feel enriched by my connection with Emerge. I feel it's all worthwhile. You know, the books written, they're, they're, they're experts who talk about how, how do you live a meaningful life? Um, I feel I'm just empty. I'm just existing and not doing anything of consequence. Well, get engaged in politics, get engaged in the arts, uh, just get engaged and you will, you will discover things about yourself you didn't know and you will make a contribution to this world and to this community and you will feel enriched yourself and you will understand that life can be and is and must be worthwhile. Thank you so much, Governor Kunin. Thank you for founding Emerge Vermont and for setting the example and for your incredibly inspiring words that you just spoke. You are my hero. You are our hero. Thank you. Shiro, Thank you. I should say. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for doing a wonderful job with tonight's event.
Thank you so much. So also before we forget, happy birthday, Governor. Thank you. <laughs> So thank you, Governor, for laying the groundwork for Emerge Vermont and making it what it is today, which is an extremely successful organization that empowers democratic women to run for office and win. With 149 alumni and 44 of them in office right now, Emerge Vermont has proven that we can change the face of government and get women elected. We are so grateful to all of our sponsors this evening and all of our friends who joined us online. We saw your wonderful comments. It's such a wonderful community. We're so grateful for all of, all of you and we cannot do our work without you. We're ready to meet 2022 head on and get as many democratic women on the ballot as possible. If you're committed to changing the face of government and getting more women elected as we are, I hope you'll make a contribution to Emerge Vermont today to support our important, essential work. Visit emergevt.org or click on the link just emailed to you to contribute to now. To contribute now. And before we go, I'd just like to say thank you again for joining us this evening. And I'm going to introduce to you Emerge Vermont Cabinet Member Alex McLean for some parting words. Thank you and have a lovely evening. Thank you, Elaine. What an amazing, inspiring evening. I'm Alex McLean, a member of Emerge Vermont's cabinet. I am so proud of all that Emerge Vermont has accomplished and to be able to share our successes with all of you. But we're not taking a break. We can't afford to. 2022 is a big year and we're going to work hard to elect more women and to see Emerge Vermont alumni up and down the ballot. We want to elect more women on town meeting day to select boards and school boards. We want to see more women on the ballot in the August primary and the general election. And with your support, we will do it. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for this wonderful celebration of women in politics. I hope you all have a great evening. <laughs>